Hi, my name is Sean Lannon. I'm an orthopedic surgeon at Florida Medical Clinic and Advent Health uh, here today to discuss managing ankle trauma um, from the initial evaluation all the way through uh, deciding who needs surgery, how we perform the surgery, and what are some of those outcomes. So this is something we've all seen, whether you're an orthopedic surgeon or a family practice doctor or an internal medicine doctor, we've all seen someone or probably been asked to evaluate someone with an ankle that looks like this. And so whether it's something benign as a first time ankle sprain like this with ecchymosis and, and a common injury or something serious uh, or severe like this ankle fracture dislocation in an elite NBA player, um, my goal is to be able to take you through uh, the steps and about how I think about these injuries and how I treat these in my so first, we're, go, we're going to describe the anatomy of the ankle just so we're all, all on the same page. And then we'll get down to the nuts and bolts of discussing the management, both in, acutely in the emergency room or right after the injury. And then in my clinic, how I decide who needs surgery, why they need surgery, and then in the operating room, how and uh, why I think about these things and, and operate accordingly to these. So a little bit about myself, just since I'm relatively new to the area, these are my stepping stones in getting here. I'm originally from the hill country of Texas. Um, I did my undergrad at Loyola University of Chicago. I stayed in Chicago for med school and stayed at Loyola for medical school. I got smart and came back to the warm weather in Tampa and did my orthopedic surgery residency at the University of South Florida. Midway through my residency, Florida Orthopedic Institute and USF emer emerged into uh, the Department of Orthopedic Surgery for the USF, and so I became a part of that organization as well. I then went on to North Carolina to do my fellowship at Duke University in foot and ankle surgery, and then came back uh, to join Florida Medical Clinic as their only uh, orthopedic surgeon specializing in foot and ankle surgery. So when we talk about the ankle joint or the tibial tailor joint, it's really comprised of only three bones. Uh, the tibia, the fibula and the talus. And what's important is that these three bones act to provide stability to the talus and the ankle morse itself right here. Um, the bony articulations have really a minor role in the stability of the ankle. It's more um, the ligaments that connect the bone that provide the stability and injuries to the bones and the ligaments together um, are what we have to evaluate and treat. Uh, both non-operatively and operatively when these injuries come in. So you can see here, these are gross dissections of the ligaments of the ankle, um, actually beautifully done. And I'd like to point out first, this is in yellow, the anterior talofibular ligament. This is the most common injury or ligament uh, injured in a regular uh, run-of-the-mill ankle sprain. And you can see here, it doesn't really necessarily provide a whole lot of stability to the ankle mortis. More importantly, seen here in red, are the ligaments that do provide the stability to the ankle morris. On the inside, or the medial aspect, you see the deltoid ligament. And then um, in red, along the anterior lateral and posterior lateral aspects of the ankle, you see the syndesmosis. That's comprised of three separate ligaments, the anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament, the inner osseous ligament, and then seen here from the back, the posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament. This is a, a large, strong ligament with a broad insertion, and usually um, the ligament does not tear. You uh, usually have a posterior myolus fracture that is pulled off by this ligament that's left intact. Um, on the medial side, we have the deltoid ligament that is, uh, can be partitioned into two separate ligaments, the superficial and deep components. In my mind, this, Determining if the deltoid ligament is injured is the most important step in, in clinic for me to determine if a patient needs surgical treatment or not. Oftentimes, that's the last thing holding the talus back in the, the ankle morris, and if that's injured, then that usually dictates that the patient needs surgery, uh, or if it's uninjured, those, treat, those patients can usually be treated successfully non-operatively. So now that we're all on the same page about the anatomy, I'd like to discuss the uh, management of these injuries. These are very common injuries. We see over 
one million of these visits in the emergency room each year. And every day in America, there's 25,000 ankle sprains that happen. So this is something that we see repeatedly throughout our emergency rooms, uh, not only in the area, but across the country. When we talk about who needs radiographs when they come in uh, to your clinic or to the emergency room, these, this is a depiction of the Ottawa ankle rules that is meant to decrease the burden or the amount of radiographs we obtain of ankles just for simple soft tissue injuries like sprains. So if a patient uh, cannot take more than four steps after the injury or uh, in the emergency room and they have tenderness palpation on the, the posterior aspect of the lateral malleolus, the base of the fifth metatarsal or the navicular, those patients need uh, radiographs. When we talk about ankle sprains, I demonstrated further uh, or earlier, injuries to the talofibular ligament are the most common. Seen here, there's also the calcaneofibular ligament that provides subtalar stability and can be commonly injured as well. This ligament actually provides the floor or comprises the floor of the perineal tendon sheath um, and can be injured in more severe injuries. When we talk about sprains, it's more semantics. It doesn't necessarily dictate uh, our treatment, but a grade one sprain is tearing or stretching of the ligament with small tears less than a third of the width of the ligament. A grade two sprain is up to two thirds uh, of the ligament torn and a grade three sprain, which is most commonly what we see is a tear of the entirety of the ligament. If a patient cannot bear weight, I usually place those patients uh, in a splinter boot, and I suggest a splinter boot uh, depending on what your resources are, either in the clinic or uh, the emergency room, and giving the patient crutches or some way for them to offload or be at least partially weight-bearing. If they can bear weight, um, a boot or a lace-up ankle brace, depending on the severity of their pain and swelling at the time, can be helpful to mobilize those patients. And then in clinic, my, I always talk to patients about early physical therapy or home exercise program to get the perineal tendons gliding, to control the swelling, and uh, to regain the perineal tendon strength. And then at the same time, starting proprioceptive exercises to regain the function. If the patient does have a fracture, um, usually you're seeing these patients in the emergency room. The first thing you have to, to figure out, is this an open or closed fracture? Um, if it's a open fracture, IV antibiotics need to be started immediately prior to um, any other management uh, because this is going to dictate their uh, chance or risk, lower their risk for infection greater than anything that you do. And then after that, if this is a dislocation or the talus is laterally translated, the goal is to get the talus back under the tibia and keep it there. And then once the talus is back under the tibia, is this a stable injury or not? So if someone comes in with a dislocation or either a subluxation with lateral translation of the talus, I always recommend, even if it looks deformed, uh, and the patient screaming to always get an x-ray first to know what you're dealing with. I've had many people um, come in with a deformity of the foot and ankle, get misdiagnosed as an ankle fracture. It was actually a subtalar dislocation. Um, so it's always important to uh, get an x-ray first. Um, when you're proceeding with your reduction, you can do this under conscious sedation or hematoma blocks, uh, but it's important to flex the knee to relax the Achilles tendon and gastric muscle to provide longitudinal traction and then an inversion stress to get the talus back underneath the fibula and to maintain that fibular length. After you've reduced the ankle, you want to splint. And the first rule of medicine is always the first do no harm. I always tell people to use a posterior and use splint to further control the ankle. You want to make sure they have enough padding, knowing that they're going to swell, that they're not going to have any soft tissue injuries, um, but you really want to stabilize the ankle and for, make sure that they're immobilized in all planes. After they're in the splint, you get a post-reduction x-ray to make sure that you truly are dealing with a reduced ankle that's in the proper position. It helps guide us management, our management as orthopedic surgeons after that, because usually that's one when we get on board and start making decisions about what needs to happen next. Um, if this is a stable injury in the splint, they can undergo acute open reduction internal fixation uh, with plates and screws, uh, or um, they can be sent to clinic. Uh, for further management and scheduled as an outpatient. That's usually my preferred line of uh, seeing these patients 
because it gives us a chance to talk more about the surgery uh, in a more controlled environment, assess the soft tissues better, and I believe outcomes are better in my hands in, in regards to that. If this is an unstable injury like this that you see to the right, then we we talk further about what needs to be done urgently, whether it's external fixation or you know, proceeding with acute open reduction internal fixation. This was a patient of mine who came in uh, through the emergency room. You see here, uh, supposedly was splinted by EMS in the field. Um, this is not adequate. And you can see that the talus is not underneath the tibia. The fibula is still wildly displaced. And this was actually an open injury. Here are three examples of um, other injuries that, that illustrate the point. To the left, you see this is a bimalleal or ankle fracture, but the talus is underneath the tibia. You don't see any lateral translation of the talus, and if you were to splint this, this would be a stable injury. In the middle, this is the ER's reduction attempts of that same patient you just saw, and you can see here this needs a little more work and a little more help. That talus is not underneath the, the tibia. The fibula is still displaced and you can imagine that soft tissue and skin on the medial aspect is still under tension and, and under a lot of duress. On the right, this is something called a pilon fracture. This is an intraarticular distal tibia fracture and fibula fracture. And I included this because uh, this is something that we see in high energy fractures and injuries. Um, you can see the talus is relatively well underneath the tibia, but the entire ankle is shortened. Um, and you can see here the fibula is already shortened a uh, centimeter and a half. This is a severe bony injury, but also a severe soft tissue injury that needs to be brought back out to length and stabilized for a period of time. And, and this is why after placing him in external fixation immediately after his injury, you can see the evolution of the soft tissue injury here with the fracture blisters developing both on the inside and outside of the ankle. And these track actually all the way posteriorly as well. And you can see here, this patient is in uh, no situation for me to place an incision on him to fix his uh, bones with plates and screws uh, because one, I'd be unlikely to get the soft tissue closed at this time, and two, that would raise his risk of infection greatly. You can see just how severe of a soft tissue injury this, these injuries truly are, though, because this is post-op day 10 on the right, and you can just... And you can see here how large that uh, blood-filled blister has become, and this is um, when I uh, talked to patients about uh, popping these blisters and beginning aggressive soft tissue care to uh, get them to the operating room as soon as possible. So now that we're out of the acute phase, I'd like to talk to you about things that I think about when I see a patient in, uh, in the office or on consultation. Um, why I uh, think about uh, things in these terms, and then in the operating room, how I fix these or address these injuries. And I think what's best to illustrate this is just by taking you through a few cases and talking through those. So case one is a 19-year-old female who was rounding second base while playing softball. She twisted her ankle, was immediately unable to ambulate, had uh, a large amount of edema and ecchymosis, and presented immediately to the emergency room. We have these radiographs here that show that she's got a fracture of the distal fibula and look relatively benign. The talus is underneath the tibia. She was splinted and sent out. When I saw her in clinic, I noticed that there's more to this injury than the x-rays show. Uh, you can see the distal fibula fracture here is displaced. Her talus, excuse me, her talus is laterally translated. Her medial clear space here, which is an uh, indirect measure of if her deltoid ligament is intact or not, is widened, and her tip-fib overlap here has decreased. So not only does she have a fracture of the distal fibula, she has torn her deltoid ligament and also torn her syndesmosis. So in this case, this is, these are the patients I talked to about not only fixing the uh, bones and realigning the anatomy in that sense, uh, but also fixing the ligaments to provide her the best functional outcome. So these are her radiographs six months out from injury. You can see here, um, I restored the fibula uh, anatomically. This is uh, healed nicely. Um, her tip-fib overlap is decreased here, seen on the AP, and her medial clear space is now narrowed down and symmetric to the contralateral side. This is a newer device on the market called a fibular nail. This device has been around for uh, several years 
years now, but this newer uh, implant allows us to obtain proximal fixation here with talons that are deployed. And what this does is it allows us to perform the surgery through relatively small incisions. Uh, as opposed to uh, a normal incision with the plates and screws that you can see here that I would have to use uh, to plate this distal fibula and to get access to um, the bone. This also decreases, using the fibular nail, decreases the risk of iatrogenic injury to the superficial perineal nerve that crosses the superior margin of the surgical field here. So why are we so worried about millimeters of translation? Well, we've known all the way back from the mid-70s, this is an article published in Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery by Ramsey and Hamilton that showed that just one millimeter of lateral translation of the talus changed uh, disrupted contact forces by 42%. Two millimeters of translation, which is a relatively small amount, um, probably what that patient had uh, changed her contact forces, would change the contact forces in the talus by 64%. And what this leads to is if you change the contact forces across the ankle with the, with the large amount of force that goes across the area, you get a rapid development of post-traumatic arthritis. So case two is one that ill illustrates a lot of teaching points actually, is that uh, this was a 20 year old male who was um, hunting hogs in North Florida. He fell 10 feet off a tree that he climbed, out of a tree he climbed uh, while hunting. He said he was able to walk back to the truck, but he couldn't drive um, and was seen in our emergency room um, at Advent at Zephyr Hills, I believe. He um, had radiographs there they told him he just had a sprain of, of his ankle. He comes into my clinic, has these radiographs, and I um, start to say, well, there's a little bit of uh, opening of the medial clear space, maybe. There's maybe a little decrease in his tip-fib overlap. And then talking to him, he tells me he's got lateral knee pain. So I order tip-fib radiographs, and you can see here, he's got a clear fracture of the proximal fibula. This with pain in the ankle and this fibula fracture, this is a, a special variant called a mason new fracture. Uh, what happens in these injuries is that you have an external rotation force that goes through the ankle joint, tears the deltoid ligament, tears the syndesmosis, and the force or the energy uh, results in a fracture of the distal fibula at the proximal level up near the knee. So you can see here the way to best diagnose this is with stress radiographs. Um, so there's three examples of how to obtain stress radiographs. One on the left is a gravity stress uh, that's usually typically more comfortable for the patient. I try to get this in clinic. If you can't do that, this is an external rotation stress test. You can see here you control the tibia and externally rotate the foot while you obtain radiographs. And then the third is if the patient's able to tolerate, if they can weight bear, you can uh, place them in a boot, allow them to weight bear to tolerance, and then have them back in the clinic for weight bearing radiographs that acts as a stress view as well. So this is this, this gentleman's uh, stress views interoperatively using fluoroscopy. You can see here, compared to his his radiographs before, he's got a significant increase in medial clear space and decrease in his tip fib overlap. Uh, and his ankle and talus laterally translate, even though there's an, a fibular fracture very proximal to the ankle. So here you can see how I treated this patient. I first started with a, a repair, a direct repair of the deltoid ligament with. Um, Suture anchors, those are radiolucent, so you can't see those here. And that allows the talus to come back underneath the tibia. And then I perform an open reduction internal fixation of the patient's syndesmosis. So this, this is a flexible device. There's a screw that goes into the tibia, a suture that connects both of these screws together to allow some physiologic range of motion, but provide the stability while the ligaments heal. And these are his weight-bearing radiographs six weeks after injury. He's comfortable complaining of no pain at this point. So case three is a little more severe injury, but illustrates some of the points I made earlier about soft tissue injuries and, and more severe ankle trauma. This is a 47-year-old male who fell, fell off a stage uh, approximately six to seven feet. 
Um, he was unable to ambulate. He presented to the emergency room where these radiographs were obtained. He was splendid and senile. Now, as opposed to uh, the gentleman who was externally, who was placed into external fixation prior uh, and prior in the presentation, you can see here, he also has shortening, but he has shortened through his tibia. Um, he has no fractures of his fibula. This is a, a severe injury as well. This is the intraarticular distal tibia fracture. And then you can see here just how short uh, his fractures actually are. This is a gentleman who, uh, had I seen in the emergency room, I probably would have offered him external fixation for soft tissue rest or immediate ultra reduction external fixation, knowing that his soft tissues were going to swell and that he was going to wait some time to be uh, ready for fixation. And these intraarticular fractures and even extraarticular fractures, it's important uh, to fully evaluate the injury. This is a CT scan of this patient. You can see here, not only does he have a fracture of the anterior and uh, central portion of his tibial plafond that's in several pieces, he also has a large fracture of the posterior tibial plafond as well. And there are cartilage that are attached to this, and this is predisposes him to having a worse outcome um, because of his injuries to his cartilage and a more rapid development of post-traumatic arthritis. So after waiting uh, 10 to 14 days for his soft tissues uh, to be amenable to surgery, this is his final fixation pattern. So uh, in order to buttress his entire distal tibia that had uh, been shortened and fractured uh, and migrated. I used this medial plate to further stabilize and buttress that. I was able to fix his anterior lateral cartilage relatively close to being to anatomic. Um, and then posteriorly, I augmented his fixation with a posterior medial plate of the distal tibia. After fixing both of these fragments, his syndesmosis was actually found to be stable because the ligaments were actually attached to the bone and not torn during his injury. And this is his radiographs six months out from his injury. Uh, he's back into a normal shoe, back working, uh, and actually very comfortable and very pleased with the progress he's made up to this point uh, through a very severe traumatic injury. So that's all I have have for you today. I hope that uh, this answered some questions, was able to demonstrate just how I think about these injuries, uh, ranging from sprains to severe PUON injuries. If you have any questions, my list, list my email here. Feel free to contact me. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, and I look forward to seeing everyone in the hospital and treating the patients in the area. Thanks.